Okay. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our moderator, um, Saul Nassisi, for our next panel, uh, Marketing Decisions Based on Data Analytics. Great. Thank you very much. All right. Welcome, everyone. That's right. Clap. Um, <laughs> So thank you. Marketing uh, decisions based on data analytics. That's my notes there. Um, so data analytics and marketing. I mean, they're two really important topics. I like to think of it like peanut butter and jelly. You need the peanut butter. You need the jelly separate. They're not that great. You put them together. You have something wonderful. So let me ask people here. How many people were on Facebook or LinkedIn or some social media network today? Right? Okay. How many people watched uh, Netflix or some kind of streaming service? A lot of people. How many people took Uber or did some kind of transportation like that? All right. So the point is, is that every time you're doing that, as you probably know, you're not just interacting, you're not just taking a ride, you're not just watching, you're also generating data. Terabytes and terabytes of data every day that we as marketers get to use, okay, if we have the knowledge and the tools in order to help influence people to get them to, uh, to communicate, to properly um, talk about what our products and services are. And so the modern marketer today needs to understand how to use data analytics and how analytics can influence the decisions we as marketers make. If you're able to do that, you can create wonderful things and do wonderful things. And we've seen that. We've seen markets that have happened, companies that have grown. We've even seen elections that have been influenced through the use of data. So today, we've got three great panelists who are going to give us some case studies and examples of how they've used data uh, to make marketing decisions. So let's get into it. Our first panelist is Clayton Branch. Clayton is a 2016 uh, MBA graduate with a concentration in business analytics. He uh, uh, currently works for LMI, where he transforms data into insights and displays them, on, displays them on dashboards. I'm assuming mostly Tableau, but maybe there are other tools also. Click. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Clayton, take it away. All right, hello everybody. Okay. Hello? Hello? All right, there we go. <laughs> okay. My title page is not here. Anyway, um, so I work at LMI, which is a government consulting firm in Washington, D.C., focusing on helping agencies in the defense and health sector. So um, I started this job actually about three months ago. And those clients aren't super keen on you sharing uh, information about their projects. So luckily, uh, today I'm bringing over something from my two years I spent at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts uh, as a marketing analyst. So, um, so here's the case I'm going to present. So uh, the Kennedy Center is a performing arts organization. And they have a ton of programming every year. So it's over 2,000 events that uh, go from opera to orchestra to theater to ballet, dance, comedy, and hip hop. So that's a lot of events, a lot of ticket inventory that the marketers there have to uh, account for. Um, and one of the biggest areas where the Kennedy Center generates revenue is from these subscriptions packages. And um, while they are very good products for hardcore fans um, of a certain art form, that there's weaknesses that come from this. Because number one, the packages are really expensive. And then number two, they often are only limited to one genre, so one art form. So it's hard to um, entice people who are not 100% sure they want to see 10 orchestra shows. So, uh, so the challenge here is that I wanted to design a new product that people could uh, interact with in a, way, in a more diverse way. So how can we market across genres? So here's my pitch that I um, presented. So basically, it was an idea of having a Netflix-style subscription product for, uh, for the arts. And so the idea would be that we have all this ticket revenue, and you know, not all of these are sold out events. So there's opportunity to maximize this underutilized inventory. So, um, so I conceived of it as of having two layers, so a more premium 
we'll call it the HBO option, where it's $100 a month. You get two tickets, and it's in the, um, like a more prime seat, but maybe not during a prime location. I mean, a prime uh, schedule date. And then there was a Hulu style, where it's $50 a month. And I know this seems a little bit high for a subscription, a monthly subscription, but in the arts world, people are spending $200, $300, $400 on one ticket for some of the prime events. So, uh, so people who are interested in the arts, this actually is a value play. Um, and, a, and a way that, in a way to make sure we're not cannibalizing existing product sales is that uh, this project was focused on people who had never spent more than $110 on a single ticket and had never been subscribers. Uh, and finally, the last aspect of this product is that it's designed with the idea that each month the content refreshes so that you're eligible to get those two tickets for. So that way you can uh, continually engage the audiences with, in new ways each month. So this project had three phases, which um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with. Yeah, we got the data collection and mapping phase, we got the analysis phase, and we got the product design area where, um, where we kind of get into the nitty gritty of the project. So basically, in the first stage, that's, uh, that's like the messy part. That's where I have to go in, mine the data, um, find out, um, what patterns already exist, and then try to like uh, visualize the connections between those uh, between the buying habits of people who buy multiple art forms. Second, um, we just had to put a number, like we had to quantify it. So, how do these people who are subscribers? How do they interact with these other art forms? And what sort of crossover is it? So, does um, do a lot of orchestra buyers also buy theater, or are they more likely to buy ballet? So how does that work? So we have to quantify that. And then finally, uh, the product design area is um, what is our key audience? Because basically for this subscription product to work, we have to choose a core set of audience that's going to make up the majority of the content, and then as an anchor, so that um, so that that's there when the other rotating content comes in. And then lastly, even though I had the proposal of 110, uh, 150 for the price points, I have to investigate uh, based on our existing price patterns and ticket inventory whether those are realistic uh, numbers to generate revenue. So uh, basically, Again, this, the managing the inventory is the really important part of this because as the product developer, I'm not going to be the one implementing this project. You know, I have to work closely uh, with the marketing managers. And in the Kennedy Center's case, each marketing, uh, each art form has its own marketing manager. And so what happens with that is that the opera has a marketing manager. And so let's say we chose orchestra as the core genre. And um, and I'm talking to, but then I end up talking to the opera manager, and she says, I, you know, it looks like I'm not going to sell this, this Thursday show next month. I'd like to add this to the subscription product. So we want to use, the whole point of this project was to make it so that people could, the marketing managers could take advantage of their artistic insights and allow them a new way to distribute this content. And uh, one other element to this is that they, uh, the Kennedy Center spends a lot of money on third-party sites such as Travel Zoo and Gold Star, which resell, uh, which are bulk buyers, and then they resell tickets to other people. So um, if they're able to distribute these tickets from an internal product, then it saves them money from having to pay to these outside vendors. So uh, during this process, I primarily used three different tools to carry this out. So the first part, I used uh, SQL to connect the 
three different databases. So we had a database with ticketing information, so like information on specific tickets, um, also customer data, and then performance data. So those don't live in the same place. So I had to uh, connect those databases, and then uh, once I did that, uh, mine the data from there. Uh, secondly, I used R, uh, ggplot2, woo, <laughs> uh, to, to do some uh, network maps and kind of visualize the connections between, uh, between the data. And then uh, lastly, I used the Microsoft Azure uh, machine learning tool, just uh, machine learning studio to help, uh, you know, do the, do the analysis. I mean, I could have also done it in R, but... Um, but the machine learning studio, it has a little bit of an in, um, the interface allows you to do a lot of quick iterations and also incorporate those results into plain Excel files so non-power users can kind of see what the results of your models are. So, um, so yeah, those were the tools I used. And um, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions later on. Great. All right, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Divya Minda. Divya was a 2016 MS in Business Analytics graduate. She is currently a customer, a customer analytics advisor with CVS, working on the health customer analytics team. And uh, she told us that she enjoys unlocking stories from numbers and developing business savvy analytics solutions. So Divya, thank you. take it away. So I'd like to take a minute to go through the slide. I know it's the very first time I saw this, my reaction was like, oh, wow, that's going to be cool and very helpful for my boyfriend. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make here is this is definitely a little exaggerated at this point of time, but this nearly is going to be the future of marketing when it comes to integrating AI, integrating IoT with all, with all the home devices that we are using these days. And this would probably redefine what personalized marketing means to us in the digital world. So for the next few minutes, I would just try to highlight the top few AI in digital marketing trends that are going around in the past two years. The first one is hyper-personalization. So we have seen a lot of examples in the previous panel discussions as well that we usually go to a level of personalization wherein we are targeting a specific group based on the marketing message that we are sending. But people nowadays are moving away from that segment-based marketing to an audience of one. They will want to know what exactly matters to an individual and accordingly develop marketing content or probably marketing offers and promotions for the brand. The classic example would be Starbucks, a brand with whom you engage probably almost every day. Right? So Starbucks has its own digital app wherein you can place orders. And the interesting thing about Starbucks is they have started using AI with all the humongous data that they have to finally craft the offers for every individual customer. So an example out here, so do you see the star flavor? So each time you enjoy a turkey pesto panini, you get an offer. So that's so finely crafted for one user who really would most likely Go in and buy one. The next one is creative intelligence. So I think in the next panel, we had a little bit of a discussion regarding that, that AI, because of the data which we have right now available in the digital world, is going and having traction in how do we develop creatives. Now, we have seen personalizing offers. But when it comes to personalizing creative, we thought that that's not possible. But let me tell you, there are a lot of marketing technology companies out there who are trying to have personalized creative videos, personalized banners for every individual, and not just one cohort or a segment of consumers. So one example I would like to give you is the recent one which happened somewhere in mid-2017 is Toyota RAV4 campaign, wherein they tried to use IBM Watson machine learning program to come up with an innovative way to create multiple versions of their creative for every individual user. So how, that, how does that go? So they had their users targeted on Facebook. They knew what are the main activities a user would like. Let's say for me, for example, the kind of activity I like is running. 
So they have used uh, IBM machine learning program to come up with an activity which would relate to running. And that's how they have projected this entire video of Ralph Forsens. It's an SUV bringing up that active uh, motive and message and applying a little bit of gamification out here, which kind of engages every individual. So uh, the way the screen would go is like, the activity we have identified for you is running, and let's, uh, we are running an AI algorithm to find what could be a similar activity that you should try and you would enjoy, and then that's how they bring in. So it's a little bit of subtle marketing. The next one I would like to talk about is programmatic advertising. So this is actually a savior for marketers in the digital world. We have a lot of channels out there, and we want to be everywhere. And the biggest dilemma a marketer really has is unlimited expectations with a very low budget, which is given to the marketing department. So you would want to make sure if there's a way to optimize every dollar you spend on every digital impression you give to the audience out there. So that's where AI has been very finely used in the past two years, and we have come up with tools for programmatic advertising. To give you an example out here, we initially, in an era, we used to broadcast our marketing messages to everybody, let's say TV. Now, the concept there was that reach as many as you can. But today, the world is different. You don't want to reach as many as you can. You want to reach the people who are most likely to respond to your message, right? So now, how does programmatic advertising works? A media buyer is going to go and buy a digital inventory from a demand side platform. And it's only when, let's say, if I am a user and I am somewhere near the coast and I'm searching for a surfboard, it is an activity that interests me. It's a location where I can actually use a surfboard and go and do that sport. And that's where, based on my search patterns, based on my interest, demographics, geography, location, it's then that ad will be portrayed to me, and it wouldn't be shown to somebody who's like 1,000 miles away from the coast, and it doesn't make sense, right? The last one that we would like to go to, and I wanted you guys to watch this video, uh, this is more about conversational commerce. I think we just saw in the example of Sonos how voice is getting traction, and it's interesting to see how voice assistance can actually be integrated with marketing. Now, at this point of time, we have, in the digital world, we have searches. We have text searches, and we have page searches, organic searches. We try to identify what people are looking for, right? Now, there is a time, and it's, it's going to be more advanced, wherein you just have to recognize the search voices based on what people are asking Alexa, right? So one of the examples here is a chatbot, which was created by CoverGirl, and it's one of its kind. I hope that plays. Oops. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Kalani Hilliker. And when I'm not filming Dance Moms, I like to share my life on social. And sometimes I get to work with awesome brands like CoverGirl. Kalani is one of CoverGirl's favorite influencers. As CoverGirl's partner, we wanted to invent a better way for Kalani to chat with fans that would also drive e-commerce. Meet Kalani Buck. She lives on Kick, and I am proud to say she's the world's first influencer chatbot. Together, we tapped into the power of chatbot technology and created a dynamic one-on-one -on -one interaction for fans. She knows my sense of humor. I mean, look at those moves. The AI used conversational data to recreate Kalani's unique voice. It was important that Kalani Bot's interactions were authentic and personalized. CoverGirl's integration was fun and natural. We only presented branded content when fans expressed genuine interest in makeup. Because of CoverGirl, I'm able to give my fans a gift they can actually use, coupons. Investing in Kalani and her content opened up a new sales channel for CoverGirl. We were amazed that with only three posts driving traffic, Kalani had over 60,000 unique users talk with her bot. Fans were extremely engaged in the conversation, and on average, their conversations lasted several minutes. The top used words included loved, awesome, thanks, want, and favorite. By presenting CoverGirl how-to content before offering a coupon, Kalani Bot authentically guided fans through the conversion funnel, 
resulting in an incredible 51% click-through rate. Replicating Kalani's infectious energy with scalable AI created an immersive experience for fans that bridged the gap between content and commerce for CoverGirl. So that's the message I wanted to share. So there has always been this gap in e-commerce and brick and mortars, but when you don't have somebody assisting you, you just go online, figure out things for yourself, maybe read some consumer reviews. But these kind of products, like a Kalani bot or even Alexa for that matter, they are trying to be a help. Uh, the robots and the AI is trying to be a help and be an assistant, wherein trying to suggest. And that makes marketing more efficient because it's not direct chasing the consumer. It's more like it's subtle. And the consumer is getting used to the fact that marketing is actually helping them to get the best available offers. So these are the trends to watch. And if you're a marketer, there's a lot to do in digital world. And if you're an analyst, you have a ton of opportunities out there. Any queer questions out here? Well, let's actually right. hold the questions until, the, um, until all three of you have presented. But thank you very much, Divya. That was great. OK, our next speaker, uh, Luigi Salvatore is a 2015 um, MS in Marketing Analytics graduate. He also has a certificate in Business Analytics. Luigi um, is a data scientist at Dell EMC supporting global business operations. So Luigi? Yeah. All uh, hi, everybody. Um, so I wanted to talk more about what I do, my job, so that maybe like you guys can see what we, what we do and have questions later. And we can start a conversation about like, some analytics or like, uh, conceptually what we are doing. Um, so, we, uh, as a data scientist supporting a uh, sales operation there, um, I work mostly with uh, all sort of data that comes from uh, different data sources. And our job is either to report, to predict, to analyze, um, in order for the leadership to either change their policy or implement a new policy, understand what the trend is, in order to understand if we're going to get the goals, and, and so on and so forth. So the main two data sources that we are using is Salesforce, which is a software that aggregates all the uh, opportunity data that the, the reps are putting into the system. And that's very helpful in order to optimize the process of operations so we can have uh, reporting, we can assess the risk within the quarter, and so on and so forth. And Greenplum, which is like where we have our data lake, which where it stores mainly all the information about the customer, the history of our bookings, the quote information, um, information about contracts and all sort of information that we store. Uh, so this part of the data is very important. There are like a lot of uh, focus on getting the right data. The problem here is that as we uh, have like such a worldwide approach to the business, because we sell worldwide, we have different uh, geographic divisions, we have different hierarchies, and so it's a, essentially it's like a very um, hard problem to solve is to optimize all these different hierarchies that we have in terms of customers, locations, and put them aligned so that at the end of the day, we have a flattened data set that can be used, can be leveraged, it can yield the same numbers across the different function of the business. So once that is accomplished, which is a very challenging part, especially since like Dell MC merged, and so there are two different systems that are merging together. But then when this part is like accomplished, then there is um, the opportunity for insights. So what the insights are could be like analytics, so looking at the history, looking at the current data, and see if there is a current pattern, or if there is a difference between this, uh, this quarter or next quarter or last quarter, and so on. Um, or predicting analytics. In that case, we look at historic data, and we look at patterns, and we feed like statistical models, such as like random forest, or like um, we also use like uh, logistic regression, and we try to figure out and to help uh, the business assessing risk. Um, so that's one of the other like uh, uh, opportunity that we have there. And then once we have two sort of uh, analysis, then we need to visualize. We need to like make them available for everyone because, um, as you guys know. Um, you know, in terms of business, you know, you want to get like the right answer, but then like all the technical stuff you cannot go into like a, a executive meeting. So we have like um, tools that we use, such as Tableau, in order to visualize and in order to like make our like uh, you know in our work like available for everybody. Um, so 
as I said, you know, the foundation of our work is like having like the data uh, correct. And so there is a, a function of the business that uh, links all these different data sources and puts it together. Because uh, as I said, like, you know, for example, Salesforce is a or is or universe. Then there is the code universe, then there is the bookings. And so there is a lot of uh, data architecture going there in terms of align these and make it available. And then there is the master, ma master data management. And that is like mainly about like hierarchies. So for example, a customer is break down in terms of global ultimate, which is the higher level, and then goes down to uh, levels like, for example, Bank of America is the global ultimate, then goes to like a party, which is like Bank of America in Boston, and then like there is a customer, which is Bank of America with an address, with a name. And so uh, that needs to be mapped with the, in terms of the geographical like positions, and it needs to be met, matched with the history, and so, that's a very demanding job, especially now that we, are mer we have merged. And so once we have all these data, we have a lot of uh, opportunity for analysis. We do segmentation, so we look at customers, we segment them, the top customers, the global customers, the top 1,000, the bottom 2,000, and so on and so forth, uh, by looking at the historic data. And then we have the big data white space, so we have a customers, we know what they bought, we buy third parties data and we can figure out what's the white space there. We can be aggressive, we can um, have like more pressure on them, we can sell this product and we have this white space at the customer level and also at the product level. So that for a specific product we can say okay this customer needs this product, there's a lot of white space so we might want to let the sales people know that there's an opportunity. And then the coverage visualization is like how we go to market, how are we gonna like have the right rep and the right account is the, right, uh, is the right number of reps for that uh, district, for that, and so on and so forth. And another opportunity is predictive analytics, as I said, and we use, uh, as I said, random forest. For random forest, we score opportunities and we assess what's the probability of that opportunity to, to close. So a rep, usually in Salesforce, put an opportunity and says, okay, this opportunity is very high, it's 90%. But then, like, you know, like, there are always, like, uh, reasons uh, behind, like, what people do. So, for example, if the rep is pressured to have a high forecast, it might put 90%, but in reality, it's 30%. And what our model does, it gives, a, like, a, a, a forecast of an opportunity so that the forecast can be more accurate and they, it can drive inspection in terms of pipeline uh, in order to not have surprise at the end of the quarter and say, hey, we are supposed to book, you know, 2 billion, and now we're booked 1.5, what happened? And so that's what we're trying to do there. Um, so, as I said, there are like different, a lot of functions, even though uh, it's analytics, there are very specific jobs that needs to be done there. So there's the data aspect that I talked about, then there's the analytics that I talked about, and the science, which is like more like the predictive analytics. And then for the solutions one, it's very interesting, it's like, as we are more experts in terms of technology, using, uh, having like a more like structure, like processes, we help some different uh, organization within uh, Dell EMC in order to make their processes more uh, efficient. So we have like tools such as Alteryx, which we use to leverage uh, manual work. So there are analysts who uh, download spreadsheets and then they do pivot tables and then they push into different systems. And we are able to optimize all of that by using these software that puts all together and creates like a workflow. And so that's like another very interesting uh, function of what we do. And then the, for the deli delivery aspect, we, once we have this great visualization, when we have this great uh, model, with this great analysis, we need to deliver it. And so there is a team who develops web pages, mobile apps, uh, all of that in order to, uh, once we have something that's useful, impactful, we need to deliver it to the people who need it. Um, so now just to give like a breakdown of our, our team works, like uh, there is like business analyst, program manager who have like more the, the look at the business side. Um, then there's data scientists like me, which we more like uh, focus on uh, the statistical aspect, more the technical. And then the data analyst who is like more about like reporting. And then the data architects, which is like a position that is more focusing on the managing the database and the hierarchies and all that sort of uh, backend uh, structure that is like the backbone of, uh, also of all the analysis that we do. All right, great. Thank you very much. <laughs>
thank you very much. I think that each of the panelists have given us a little peek at sort of what lies under the water, because what we see as consumers or as users is really just the very tip of the iceberg in terms of what's going on. So great, we have time for one or two questions. Um, so I'd like to open it up. Any questions? Yep, right there. What's your name? Sandy. Sandy, OK. Yeah. Uh, so thanks for the team, personally. And that was really tackling the initial. And then I have a question, because most of you presenting the way that you use data as an offensive way to you know, protect the business or to grow a business. But in the defensive way, like, for example, how do you measure the, um, how do you quantify the effect of the policy coming out from you know, the government? Because, you know, normally you just get data from the market and then you analyze how to make the product going faster, where you can sell it to more customers. But however, what if there's a you know, problem situation happen that there's a policy coming out, coming out that, that may affect your, you know, affect your performance? So how do you value, how do you quantify those effects to, you know, to your business? Yeah, actually, I actually have a great example for what you were saying. Um, uh, last year, uh, we have this model that FARC has, like how we're going to do in terms of the end of the quarter. And this model it looks at history, right? It, yeah. it's something, comes, it's something new that comes out, it doesn't pick it up. And so uh, we were aware of what was going on in the uh, UK. There was the Brexit coming out, right? There was like, but we weren't thinking about that in terms of macroeconomics. And so we didn't. Uh, Change, we didn't change the model in order to incorporate the factor that is outside of the business. It's like a macroeconomical factor that is outside of like what we usually uh, use. And so for that quarter, we, w we came short in terms of uh, forecast because we didn't incorporate that information. So after that, we started including macroeconomic factor so that we, besides our business, we can also see what's out there that could influence the forecast, especially for like a sales uh, organization like us, that we uh, have so many customers, and uh, I, even like a government decision can deeply impact how we do in terms of performance. Uh, one thing I would also add is that um, like in the consulting world, a lot of times the strategic, uh, the senior leadership teams at organizations, they'll uh, group their markets kind of based on like their ability to win contracts. So like in the lower corner here, maybe they don't have as much expertise up here. This is something they've been doing for 30, 40, 50 years and they're really good at it. And then they also quantify the market by like opportunity for growth. So lower corner, slow growth, uh, this side over here, high growth. So, so one way is that the senior leadership team uh, tries to forestall some of the effects of neg uh, negative uh, regulation or something like that, is that if they focus on areas where they have the, the high growth, high capacity to win, or just the high capacity to win, it, it kind of protects you market-wise a little bit because even if you see some adverse effects from the regulation, uh, you're in a growing market or you already have a dominant position. So that, um, that's way that companies can kind of protect themselves. Okay, right up there. Hi, uh, you do some examples with internal data, data that your company owns. And in some cases, you use external data. Can you tell us a little bit about the process of acquiring external data? Yeah. Um, so we buy like third-party data in terms of uh, marketing um, and research. So we get information about companies and in terms of what they buy in terms of storage, what kind of um, um, demand they have, what they have in place. So it's also competitive intelligence. We know what assets they are in place. Um, and this is all possible because we have an integrated system that our customers are then matched with their uh, customer number. So we are on the same level. Because one, that's one of the most challenging parties when you have data but you don't have at the same level. So our hierarchies match with their hierarchies. So that was like a process that has been done like uh, years ago with a collaboration with this third-party vendor and it's very useful and um, 
Uh, you'd be surprised how other companies do not have that, they have different hierarchies, and when you have a different hierarchies that you misalign it, then it's impossible, because like if I'm looking at Bank of America at that level of uh, a party number, Bank of America in Boston, and then on the other hand, the vendor sells me Bank of America uh, worldwide, how I'm gonna use that information, I cannot leverage it. So that's definitely a thing that's very important in terms of when you get data from third parties, understanding what's the level of data that they provide you and how you can use that data uh, to, to, be, to use your, for your analysis and for your purpose. Because sometimes the data is not the same level, you cannot use it. All right, well great, thank you. Let's give uh, our panelists a hand. Thank you very much.